Have you heard it said that once you've learned to ride a bike, you never forget? From my memory of learning to ride a bike, it was a sunny day on soft grass. At first, Dad was pushing me along, and I started to pedal, pedal, pedal away. Suddenly, he let go, and I was doing it. I was riding. Yeah, OK, maybe I fell off once or twice. But that's all part of the experience. Experiential learning, learning through doing. Can you imagine what it would be like if we tried to teach kids to ride a bike the way we currently teach subjects like maths and history? First, there would be the PowerPoint. <laughs> This would be followed by the inevitable worksheets, pages of exercises for the student to read and complete, full of information about the benefits of bike riding. <laughs> this might be followed by a fill-in-the-gaps activity. Now, in case you are unclear about this, this scenario means that you would not actually be riding anything. Fortunately, no one would ever try to teach a kid to ride a bike like that. We seem to be able to accept that practical subjects require a hands-on learning component. So why don't we do the same with all our subjects? We know as teachers how engaged and motivated our students are when they get to do hands-on learning. I know from my own teaching experience which of my lessons my students will remember forever. The ones in which I've included an aspect of experiential or hands-on learning in my teaching. It's not just me who's observed this. Research shows a significant positive correlation between hands-on learning activities and both student motivation and achievement. I believe that experiential learning should be a key part of each and every subject, and I believe it can be. One of my favourite subjects to teach is history. Of course we read about history and write about it. My students, though, get to make cuneiform writing on clay tablets construct a bow drill, write with a quill. Those are the lessons they won't forget. I brought in a quern stone once. What, you don't know what a quern is? Totally fine, they didn't either. So this is a quern. The class I was teaching was for gifted children. I asked them, so what do you think this is? One of the five-year-olds came up to take a look and said, well, obviously, it's granite. <laughs> Did I mention they were gifted? Yes, yes, very good. But what's it for? No idea. Then I poured some buckwheat in the hole in the top of the quern and showed them how the stick might fit into the other hole. I encouraged a child to use the, the stick to turn the quern's top stone. The amazement, joy, and wonder as they heard the rumble of the stones crushing the hard grains, as they felt the weight of the stones, as they had to work to turn them, and then saw the flower pouring out from between them. It was pure teacher heaven and nothing would do until every single child had ground themselves a little bag of flour each to take home. And here's me, back in the day when I was running private business, offering experiential learning opportunities for gifted children. And yes, that is me in the distance, in chain mail, being shot at by my students. <laughs> and their parents, because you can't teach medieval European history without studying the weapons and tools of the time, right? Don't worry, 
all safety precautions had been adhered to, modern personal protective equipment, or PPE, underneath my chainmail, that was a lesson my former students are still talking about. And then there was the time we made the wattle and daub hut, and the time we made the mosaics, and the time we made the rockets. You get the idea. I'm no longer offering that particular program, but I continue to use experiential learning, not just in practical subjects, not just in science and history, but in every subject I teach. Now, I work for the Department of Education. This year, my class designed, produced, marketed, and sold products to raise funds to buy ourselves a 3D printer. Oh, and along the way, the students learned maths, design technology, business skills, and English. With our families concerned about COVID and whether the ventilation in our classroom was sufficient, we made our own CO2 sensor, carried out a series of experiments, and on finding that the ventilation was not sufficient, built our own air purifier. Through this, we learned key science inquiry skills, electronics, and how to create spreadsheets to record, process, and present data. So, what's stopping us? Well, there are a few things. Funding. About this point, you're envisaging this new breed of experiential happy teacher descending in hordes upon our schools. You might be imagining these teachers explaining how to use Pythagoras' theorem as they hand so yurts to build extra classrooms. <laughs> all the while armed to the teeth with medieval weaponry, festooned with power tools. <laughs> yeah, okay, if that were true, that could cost a lot of money. Training time. You might be thinking that this would require potentially an extra two years to be added on top of our existing teaching degree to equip a teacher to provide these amazing educational experiences. That's not correct either, but it's a common misconception. Panic. Already heavily burdened teachers fear that they will have to learn new skills, self-fund teaching resources, and that they won't be able to control their classrooms. It's not just traditional administrators who believe that a quiet classroom is a good classroom. Despite the fact the classroom noise can be the result of stimulating discussions and active learning. Or it could just be that teachers are really boring people. I bloody hope not, because I am one. But I think the real issue is that we believe we can only practice experiential learning if we've already ticked the boxes. Because that worksheet, well, we can give that a 9 out of 10, and that's very attractive, isn't it? We can collate the results from the worksheet, put them into a spreadsheet, and chart them in a way that's easy to prove to somebody higher up just how splendidly the students are learning and therefore, what an awesome job we are doing. But just because a piece of data is easy to collate and report on does not make it the most meaningful, or sometimes meaningful at all. Unfortunately, these kinds of metrics are often requested and loved by administrators, parents, and media alike. We are obsessed with ticking boxes and using metrics, and teachers are left feeling that they are spending more and more time 
focused on administration and compliance instead of on teaching. This is one of the factors being cited as the reason that teachers are leaving the profession in droves. A recent Australian study revealed 75% of teachers feel their workload is unmanageable. 19% don't feel safe at school. And only 42% plan to remain in teaching long term. Worse still, if students don't enjoy learning, don't remember what you taught them five minutes after they've finished the test, don't see how it relates to them, then maybe we're not doing such a fantastic job anyway. And that's terrible for students, but also for teachers, when it comes to feeling a sense of professional pride, satisfaction, and purpose. Certainly, the data shows us that what we're doing isn't working. PISA, the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment, which measures the ability of 15-year-olds to use reading, mathematics, and science knowledge to meet real-life challenges, paints a grim picture, with Australia's scores falling in all areas. So, if we want to try experiential learning, then how can we make it practical for schools to implement? Experiential learning can be anything from conducting an experiment in science class to doing an internship as part of a university course. Experiential learning doesn't have to be during every lesson or even occur during every day. Oh, and you're still going to have to teach kids how to add and subtract fractions with unrelated denominators. That's still going to happen even when you include experiential learning. Not every teacher would have to become an expert in everything. A modest increase in funding to provide professional development and to provide experts to visit schools could make a huge impact. There are many relatively low-cost ways we can promote this way of teaching and learning. For example, when I was running private programs, I was hiring venues to do it. So every day, my teaching resources all had to be brought in and taken away again by me. This became what my students called the suitcase of randomness because Whatever subject I was teaching, somehow that suitcase had to have everything I needed in it. It wasn't ideal. Now I have a classroom of my own. I have the luxury of an entire wall of randomness. It has drawers labelled things like potential wheels, hydraulics, and forensics. You will find those drawers filled with things like milk bottle tops, popsicle sticks, plastic tubing, and sticky tape. It's not high cost, but it is high out-of-the-box thinking. But we still need support to make change. We need our educational leaders to understand that it is important that experiential learning comes first in order to ignite students' passion. It cannot be an afterthought to be enjoyed only if your students have been good boys and girls. We also need 
our educational leadership to value experiential learning and to not only permit us to do it, but to demand it. Finally, we need educational leadership to trust us to make these decisions in our classrooms. If we can ensure the provision of experiential learning first and worksheets later, then superior outcomes will follow. After all, who's going to be better at writing about the benefits of bike riding? The kid who's read about it in a book or the kid who's experienced it for themselves, falls and all.